Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul. Hopefully you're having an amazing day. Apologies for not being on camera for this one, but honestly, time kind of got away from me. I was doing some photography and also working on a couple of scripts for an uh, AMD exclusive and also just uh, another project I'm working on. So normal service, well, normal for me anyway, will resume tomorrow. With this said, the internets have been going crazy with a couple of news stories. The first of which is Intel's Alder Lake processors are actually looking to be very good. So qualification samples of Intel's Alder Lake are starting to become available. And obviously this does mean that benchmarks and more specific performance information can start to leak. I won't go into the whole spiel of it being a brand new socket and you know PCIe 5 and all of that jazz because, well, quite honestly, we've discussed it ad nauseum. But the big deal, of course, is that Alder Lake is going to bring both big and small cores into the fray. And the big cores, well, they are going to be running at 5.3 gigahertz, at least according to this new leak, uh, which is courtesy of NGA.CN. And the small cores are going to be hitting 3.9 gigahertz. Allegedly, the smaller cores are actually very impressive. Apparently, they are hitting kind of Sunny Cove-ish levels, which, well, yeah, it is kind of via machine translation, but even so, that is still pretty impressive. Furthermore, the scores, according to what we can ascertain from the engineering samples, should hit over 11,000 points. Now, they are calculating 11,300. However, I'm always a bit pessimistic when you're kind of dealing with these scores. So I'm personally going to be saying low, you know, 11,000, possibly high 10,000 for Cinebench R20, which is actually higher than what you can expect from a 5950X, which of course is a Zen 3 processor from AMD. That scores around 10,200 to 10,600, depending on the usual caveats of like what you're doing with PBO and memory speeds and all of that stuff. So that's actually really impressive, quite honestly. Again, though, these scores are originally from a uh, engineering sample run which was scoring 9300. So all they've done is basically tweak the scores based on how they feel that the, uh, or how the processor should scale. But either way, it's a very impressive result, to be honest with you, 9300 for an early ES, because Alder Lake actually does have a number of bugs at the moment. In fact, a user by the name of UKANS is actually sharing some of the bugs which are currently happening. So the ES1 Alder Lake bugs are TDP is always fully loaded, but well, frequently not so much. You know, it's not boosting correctly, but it's gobbling up all of the power. Cue normal Intel jokes here. There is a problem with the PCIe channels. It may grab the channel with the M2 interface. There's a possibility that discrete graphics cards won't be recognized. Well, with availability, how it is, they don't really need to fix that one anytime soon. But um, shh. Intel uh, Alder Lake ES3, the core display is enabled, but the core display driver is not perfect. This is the same for the H35. I'm pretty sure it's supposed to be H45 platform. Performance will be better under DDR5 memory, other annotations. And this I want you to pay particular attention to. Alder Lake needs to be run on Windows 11 to achieve a full performance. And some EL, <laughs> this is brilliant. And some Alder Lake processors cannot run under Windows 11. Now, obviously this will be fixed. But what they're basically saying here is that just with the nature of the big dot little interface or heterogeneous architecture or big core goes brr and smaller core goes less brr, well, yeah, basically Windows 11 has just changed the way that it deals with this and it's just more efficient and puts out more performance. There was actually a lot of discussion maybe a week or two ago regarding this very topic. Um, because, yeah, I mean, we've already started to see some testing from Intel's current processors, which adopt this methodology on um, mobile. So this actually has some very interesting ramifications going forward for people who have like, you know, a Zen 5 or whatever processor when we start to notice that they also will go the heterogeneous route. It's almost a great indicator that the operating system is going to have to undergo a lot of radical changes. I expect that there's going to be like a, a bedding in period for a lot of software actually. It's gonna be very curious to see how this scales, especially with games. 
And yeah, I mean, ultimately, Intel, I think, could be quite competitive. Now, for sure, there are a number of uh, fawns still in Intel's buttocks. The first buttocks fawn is that AMD, yes, will possibly, let's assume these rumors are correct, they will certainly um, have a very competitive product on the hands that is Intel, and it probably will beat Zen Freeze 5950X. However, firstly, obviously, the 5950X has been out for a long time at that point, at least in computing terms. And the second is that, well, then obviously there's the um, you know, stacked models of Zen with their huge ass caches. And those are going to be released, I'm hearing, end of the year, as I've discussed in an exclusive. So the problem is, of course, even if Intel does score a win with these, in theory, AMD can then just release a product which might be able to outperform it. I say might, although I believe it probably would. But, you know, until I actually see benchmarks, until I test it, it's would and probably. The benefit Intel could probably have, though, is they might be able to produce the parts cheaper. I mean, it really does depend on what the yields are like and a, a million other things. Like, we don't know what AMD will price the Vcash Ryzen's at. I don't think it's going to be the same slot in prices as, let's say, the 5950X or the 5900X. I suspect that they're going to ask a premium for them. But again, I'm not 100%. Those processes, though, will work for AM4 motherboards, which, again, I've leaked previously. This is quite important because if you've got a AM4 motherboard, which it will be compatible with, I don't know if it's going to work with old boards, let's say 400 series boards, but let's say you have a compatible board, it's kind of a drop-in upgrade, whereas with this, that is, you know, the 12900K, it's not going to be that. Also, the weird thing about the 12900K and its ilk is it's going to be fairly short-lived because then we're going to see the 13th gen. I am very interested in Alder Lake. Like, Rocket Lake was a great processor just to show that backporting can be a thing. It's also a great... Um, I think Intel learned a lot of lessons from it as they're trying to, you know, figure out how to best um, port a specific architecture and or product to a specific process and or, well, manufacturer, or should I say, um, fab. But yeah, very interesting one. Next up, speaking of interesting, let's be honest, ray tracing is cool. Most people don't know why it's cool, but yeah, we all know it's cool. And there's a very interesting thing which has been uploaded on the official Forza Horizon YouTube channel. I'll link it in the video description. It's episode 3. The TLDR here is that both the creative director, Mike Brown, and the lead audio designer, Fraser Strachan, Hopefully I've pronounced that correctly. If I've butchered it, please let me know in the comments below. Uh, they basically discussed how ray tracing is going to be implemented in the title, but, and this is the important part here, it's for audio design as well. Now, obviously when it comes to audio, for a lot of people, including myself to be honest, it's somewhat overlooked, but audio is an incredibly important part of, you know, gaming experiences. You know, it's like, in many ways, the 8 and 16-bit consoles, this is going back a bit, yes, but they were almost defined by the strengths and weaknesses of their audio solution. So, for example, a title on the Genesis would sound quite different from, let's say, the SNES. And I think it's very interesting, for example, just how advanced the SNES's audio um, hardware was. It was actually designed by a Sony engineer, which... You know, it's kind of a very interesting backstory there if you want to go, you know, and have a look at that if you're not familiar with it. So I think audio, as we've moved forward to like the, you know, the PlayStation 1 and the, the you know, what Microsoft did with the original Xbox, the way it handled, um, you know, surround sound on the original Xbox was really damn good for the time. And I guess what I'm trying to say is that audio is an incredibly important part of the immersive experience. And ray traced audio is, well, just as important because it will basically allow audio engineers to more accurately model how audio behaves in a different environment, i.e. obviously audio will bounce and reflect differently based upon the surfaces and just various objects around it. So, for example, are we talking about, let's say, a barrel, or perhaps you're talking about a tree, or, I don't know, 
like road surfaces and how different um, objects will be at different proximities and all of this stuff is incredibly it's very difficult to calculate let's just say that so i think that when the new Forza comes out, if you've got the audio set up for it, it's going to be very interesting to see how it's, you know, really, how it's really pushed. I'm very excited, actually, to see how ray tracing can be used more than just kind of pushing pixels on screen. I discussed this, actually, a couple of times with uh, chaps before. I did an interview with uh, Chronos Group slash um, NVIDIA's Neil, uh, Neil Trevitt, and I also discussed it with another NVIDIA engineer, um, I forgot his name, so I'm feeling like a complete idiot at the moment. But yeah, I also discussed it with them. And, you know, ray traced audio, I think, is going to be very important going forward. And I think it's really cool that we're starting to see this implemented in titles. And I think it's going to be very interesting, too, to see how it's implemented in the PC iterations. It'll be curious to see how well it scales across different graphics cards. Like, maybe that's just me being a geek. With that said, though, there is also one other small piece of news that I haven't covered yet, and this actually concerns another thing for uh, Xbox, but also Unreal Engine. We actually have a screenshot, yes, one whole screenshot, aren't we, aren't we just blessed, um, for Alpha Point, which is an Unreal 5 engine demo, and it's going to be actually released next week, officially at GDC. Basically, we're going to see a closer look at meta human rigs, cross-platform future with EOS, and obviously this is going to be working alongside in this particular um, demo, I guess. So it's going to be worked alongside the Coalition, which are obviously responsible for Gears of War, and they're going to be porting their code, of course, to Unreal Engine 5 in the future. And I think this is particularly exciting because... It's not because it's Xbox or anything like that or whatever. You know, it's just the reason I was so excited for when we saw the Lumen demo or more recently the Valley of the Ancients demo. Yes, technically UE5 Beta is now publicly available, but obviously these guys have been really getting their hands dirty and understanding how this works and we're going to see a lot more features and just coolness demoed. It's going to be very interesting to see what the future of this looks like. And, you know, there's a really big question as to the future of gaming. Like, back in a number of years ago, we saw a lot of competitiveness from different engines. Um, remember when, like, CryEngine was actually starting to get used a bit? But now, honestly, it's like UE has become so synonymous with gaming. It's like, yeah, sure, PlayStation and Xbox and PC and Nintendo are really cool, but you can make a very good argument that, as much as, let's say, Sony or Microsoft do push the gaming, you know, wins in a certain direction, really and truly, you know, Epic have just as much of a part to play. And it's a bit like, you know, in some ways, and this is kind of going off topic and a tangent, but it's a bit like, I don't know, something like AMD and NVIDIA and Intel or whomever, and you're kind of looking at, let's say, AMD, and sure, they are designing incredibly important products, but NVIDIA, AMD, they basically are still pretty much reliant on, let's say, TSMC. And there's a really big discussion, of course, of the dominance TSMC has on the market. And it's not to say that it's bad. I mean, TSMC does amazing work with its products. But yeah, it's just kind of me, I don't know, rambling. With that said, thank you very much for checking out the video. Again, apologies for it being a kind of a weird, weirder format today. But normal service will resume tomorrow. Take care of yourselves, guys. Have an amazing day. Bye for now.